task force this evening. Good evening from the Philippines and maybe good morning from somewhere else in the world. Uh, today, we're going to have, of course, a most distinguished professor slash doctor who needs no no more uh, much introduction. He's the man behind our courses and we are so grateful that we have these because of him. So please welcome uh, the V, Dr. Jane Milo, Jim De Castro. Okay, but before we uh, further listen to his beautiful topic for this evening, we'd also like to say a short prayer. Doc, will you allow me to say a short yeah, prayer sure. for, you, for this ahead. evening? So, heavy, Heavenly Father, we praise you and give you thanks for tonight. We praise you for allowing us this platform to be with each and every one. Please bless our speaker this evening, Dr. Jim De Castro, that he may enlighten us with his knowledge and that we may be able to use this knowledge for our patients' management. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the whole day. We praise you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello, thank you, Pash. Thank you, Pash, for that uh, introduction and prayer. Always a, Always a pleasure, Dr. Jim. Okay, so, so I would like to greet each one of you. Okay, go ahead, Pash. You have something to say? Yes, Finish Doc. First. So tonight, okay. you're going to okay. talk about the, the knee ligaments. You've been talking about the knee for the past few lectures that you've had, but I think this one is going to be different. Okay. Let me greet each one of you. Good evening. And uh, for our friends from other parts of the world, good morning or maybe good afternoon and, and of course, uh, maybe late in the morning. So I'm sorry for my voice. Uh, I did a concert last night and nobody attended so I end up shouting. So anyway, uh, our topic today is understanding knee ligaments. And this will be a very unique lecture because uh, as we all know, one of the most common joints that we always uh, examine and discuss is the knee. But we never thought it has a very comprehensive and very, uh, I would say unique features re with regards to ligaments. And uh, when I was preparing this lecture, I was very awed by how all these structures come into play. And this could be one reason why there is a lot of uh, uh, failure in the treatments that we are doing in the knee. Because sometimes we thought we know the ligaments and uh, we, we thought we know it, but actually we don't. So we will study together what are these uh, features of the knee that uh, needs to be understood. Okay, so let me start again with this uh, beautiful text in the Bible in Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. It says here, God gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint. So if you feel you're weak and you feel you don't have might, be thankful because God will give you strength. God will give you wisdom. So the objectives of this study is to be able to understand the detailed anatomy of the ligaments of the knee to understand the pathomechanics of knee injury that involves a specific ligament or groups of ligaments. And number three, to be able to formulate interventions that is appropriate for the ligamental injury. And number four, to institute measures in terms of training and preparations to avoid any of this ligamental injury. So the outline of our course tonight is, uh, this is a long lecture. I have maybe 140 slides. so. Uh, just bear with me. If you if you want to sleep, you can sleep. Just uh, open your ears. Okay, so 
we have uh, all these uh, topics. Number one is posterolateral corner ligaments, uh, lateral fibular collateral ligament, the anterolateral ligament. We have your medial patellofemoral ligament. We have posteromedial corner ligaments. Maybe some of these ligaments are not familiar to you, but these are their names anyway. We have iliotibial band. We have ligaments. And the last one are the meniscofemoral ligaments. So these are the ligaments that we're going to begin with posterolateral core. So what is this all about? Okay. So I would like you to focus on the drawing while at the same, so the posterior lateral corner was once regarded dark side, maybe because uh, as, as I have told you in the, uh, in the beginning, we thought we knew most of the three stabilizers. Number one, number two is the popliteus tendon. And number three, you're drawing here. Let me just point out. I hope you can see my arrow. Okay, that is what we know on the lateral side. And of course, we also know there is a popliteus, popliteus tendon right there. It goes from the posterior part of the tibia and then goes all the way up and curve around the lateral knee and then inserts into the uh, femur. Okay, hold on. And then, of course, uh, we have your ligament that connects the popliteus tendon to the femur, to the fibula, I should say. We call that the popliteal fibular ligament. So these ligaments maybe may not seem to be significant to you, but this will be very significant as we go along. Okay, so what is uh, the meaning of this? If you injure this ligament, it can actually lead to chronic knee instability. It can lead to cartilage damage and failed cruciate ligament reconstruction. Sometimes this is the common problem among surgeons. They do repair the cruciate and it was a very nice repair. But you may sometimes wonder why is it that the instability is still there? So it's, it's, it's worth looking at these ligaments because this has a role in explaining why there is a chronic knee instability. It is injured together with cruciate ligaments, the menisci, the major ligamentous structures in high-grade injuries. And this happens especially for very intense sports, and this is very important. So at least at this point, we know this is what makes up the posterolateral corner, the dark side of the knee. So if you look very closely, this is another drawing. This is from the research of Dr. Maisiner and and, uh, and, and colleagues, look at this. If you look at this area here, this is your popliteus tendon. Then the popliteus tendon is attached to your, what we call the fabello fibular ligament. We'll go into some details uh, later on. And there is another ligament attaching the, this ligament going to the fabella. The fabella, as you know, is a sesamoid bone that is found at the posterior part of the knee. So if you look at the first drawing on your left, you can see here that there is a ligament right there that is attached to the fabella. Fabella is like, it's a floating bone that protrudes up to the posterior lateral part of the knee. And this one is connected to the fibula. Look at that, that's how they are connected. So this one together the, with a popliteal fibular ligament, a very small ligament, right coming from the popliteal tendon and inserts into the fibula is what forms all these structures here. And of course, you have other structures that like the tendons of the biceps femoris. But at this point, at least this is what we refer to as the posterior lateral corner of the knee. Now, can we see it on ultrasound? Yes, of course. Now, if you look at this, you locate first the fibula and you see this only when your knee is scanned from the posterior. So from the posterior portion, you put your probe from the fib fibula, then put another, view the other side of the, 
of the probe at the fabella which is the one that protruding and that the one that connects the ligament that connects that is what we call the fabello fibular ligament now the other one is of course the popliteal fibular we explain this to be the ligament that comes from the popliteal tendon inserts into the fibular uh, bone so you, we can also see that it's very close to each other so all you have to do is just to pivot it a little obliquely outward and then you can see right on top of that uh, right below that is the tibia and of course that the popliteus tendon uh, would be the muscle that is in short axis here so what you can see here is the short axis of the popliteus tendon and then the ligament attaches from that point going to the fibula the fibula so you in you 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 have a popliteal fibular ligament one other reference that you can use of course is if you are going to uh, put a, a color doppler here and you can view actually the inferior geniculate vessels so that that could be a reference in trying to locate for this structure but this could be seen in ultrasound okay so this is uh, my own scanning so what i did is to locate first for the popliteal tendon you know the popliteal tendon is just right at the lateral portion it, it could be seen at the la lateral uh, portion of the of the knee when you are scanning for the uh, lateral collateral ligament which is actually the one right on top this is a uh, lateral collateral ligament here the one on top and if you if you move it just below that and then you look for the popliteal tendon then you just connect that ligament all the way to the fibula you are able to find the popliteal fibular ligament so that is our ligament then the other one is your arcuate ligament this is another ligament that if both if both destroyed will make the lateral part of the knee very, very unstable. Okay, so if you look at the cadaver here, you will notice that actually the arcuate connects the tibia to the fibula. So you also go posterior. Actually, a lot of these structures, that's why it's called posterior lateral corner, is you have to really sweep from lateral going to posterior. But in this case, you have to go really posterior, more on the lateral side. And then what you need to do is to locate for the fibula, to locate for the tibia. And then what connects those two areas together is the arcuate ligament. So very interesting ligament. It's a very tiny ligament, but very interesting. And then, of course, uh, we mentioned it already, this fabulo fibular ligament. So you can also view this. So you have to look for the sesamoid bone at the just on top of the, of the uh, femur should I say posterior to that and of course you connect that to the fibula and then you get the fabula fibular ligament so the posterior lateral corner actually is made up of three layers number one which is the more superficial is made up of the iliotibial band and its anterior expansion including the biceps femoris the middle part which is called the middle patella retinaculum and it has two patellofemoral ligaments, and then it has also the patellomeniscal ligaments. That is the middle portion. And then the deep portion is made up of the lateral capsule, the lateral collateral ligament, the coronary ligament. We will explain this later on what actually made up this coronary ligament, although I mentioned here it is made up of the lateral meniscal tibial ligament, but there are actually two of them. He will show you the attachment and all the details, the arcuate, the popliteus muscle tendon unit, the popliteal fibular ligament, and the fib fabella fibular ligament. So this one made up the deep layer. So in other words, the LCL is already a deep portion of the posterior lateral corner. Now listen to this. The most critical structures of the posterior lateral corner is made up of the lateral collateral ligament, the popliteal tendon and the popliteal fibular ligament. So these structures are very critical. Dr. Meissner says, if you endure any of this, it will make your knee very unstable. That is why, as we mentioned earlier, it goes with other cruciate ligaments. You fix the cruciate, but you don't fix this, you have still have an unstable knee. So that's the lesson that we can draw from this. From MRI, you can also see that. So here, this is the distribution of how these ligaments are attached to the fibula head. Look at this. 
the most posterior is the popliteal fibular ligament. Then of course, this is the arc weight. Then this is the dip, the long band. And then this is the anterior of the band. And then of course, the lateral collateral ligament here. And then of course, there's another uh, attachment of the structures of the lateral part of the biceps femoris, the superficial area on this side. So this is how they are actually being distributed. And here, this is how they are all arranged. So try to be patient with me, I should take a look at this. So here you have your biceps femoris. We have here the uh, lateral collateral ligament. Then we have here the popliteal fibular ligament. Then we have here the should I say this is the popliteal fibular, and this one is, is part of the uh, biceps, uh, should I say the popliteal arcuate, this is the arcuate ligament, and this one that goes all the way, this is the patellomeniscal ligament that goes all the way on the side of the, of the knee. So here you can, you can see all these uh, uh, unique features of this, this area that makes up all this uh, ligament uh, of the posterolateral corner. And then this one is another uh, enhanced view of the arc weight ligament. So how they are attached to the tibia and to the fibula on this side of the knee. So this is the, also the uh, cadaver uh, representation of this ligament. This is very tiny, but once they are destroyed together, as I mentioned with the popliteal fibular ligament, then of course there's a lot of problem that you will expect. Okay, so here, the teaching points is that this is responsible for varus angulation. That means there is a varus rotation with external tibial torsion during the early phase of flexion. So that is the posterior lateral corner. And together with cruciate ligaments, it could be your posterior cruciate or the posterior lateral corner. It prevents anterior posterior translation at high flexion angles. So initially, if you, if you go, actually what is referred to high flexion is anything above 30 degrees. So if you move more than 30 degrees, then this is the one that, that fires. And as, as mentioned earlier, they don't appear as an isolated injury. They always are injured together with some other structures in the knee. Now, if you have a grade one, grade two, for example, that's why we call it PLC because they are a group. They are they respond well with conservative treatment. But if you have an undiagnosed grade three posterior cruciate ligament injury, that is where it becomes a recurrent instability. And then of course you will have a failed anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, no matter what you do, and an early onset of osteoarthritis. Also, there is a possibility that uh, of course, a lot of us, without, without knowing the ultrasound sometimes, we might have an avulsion fractures of the fibular head. When the avulsion fractures of the fibular head occurs, then we can expect that those posterior lateral corner structures will be injured. But very significantly, there could be what they call the arc weight fractures or the arc weight sign. And those should alert you that something is wrong with the the entire posterior lateral corner and that you have to do something to fix it. So in the x-ray, it might just show you like this. So it's just a very simple uh, appearing fracture. But if you can recall all the structures that is attached to that area, then you will realize that you might be injuring your athlete or your patient just because of this very simple structure, giving him more uh, chronic instability. Now, 60% of all the injuries is, representing by, is represented by the posterior lateral corner injuries. And the, the injury is described as a posterior laterally directed force from a direct blow to the anterior medial part of the proximal tibia. So you are hitting yourself from the front and medial side. And then as a result of that force, there is, it's, it's almost like a contra coup. If you're describing the head, the injury happens on the opposite side. Now, the, the one which we usually talk about, the dashboard injury could also contribute to that. 
but really not much. And then, of course, anterior rotatory dislocation and hyperextension injury with external rotation. And then, of course, uh, high-grade injury associated with crochet ligament tears, meniscal tears, and injuries of the medial ligamentous structures can also contribute to that. Now, 60 to 62% of acute PCL injuries usually will have a coexisting PLC injury. So it's really worth looking at this structure, even if we don't intend to see it, maybe, but because of this information, this makes it very uh, necessary to check all this information to be able to address the necessary treatment. So PLC injuries could come in three forms, grade one, mild, grade two, partial tears, and of course, uh, grade three, uh, complete rupture, including the capsule ligamentous structure. Now, we can get a hint on how severe it is by just applying um, a virus stress test and then looking at how much uh, opening there is. So let's say zero to, zero to five millimeters, that is grade one, then six to 10, grade two, and then grade three is more than 10. So uh, that could be a very simple way to identify that you may be having a PLC injuries. Now let's go to the lateral collateral ligament. So as we all know, a very good reference to uh, lateral collateral ligament location is, uh, of course, by looking at it a posterior to your tibia on the lateral side, but at the fibular head. And then you know that you're on the side of the lateral collateral if you look at this uh, popliteus uh, fossa right here, where your popliteus tendon is attached. Okay, in fact, this could be also the reference for looking your popliteal fibular ligament. So here, it's just right to find it's a fibrillar structure, which is very uh, easy to locate. And the thickness is about 2.6 millimeters. It is the primary virus stabilizer of the knee, has a secondary restraint for external rotation and posterior displacement of the tibia. And together with popliteal fibular ligament and popliteal muscle tendon unit, it provides stability to the posterior lateral corner. So we have mentioned that earlier already. And what is very uh, amusing here is that it is innervated by different nerves, beginning from the distal third <coughs> at the level of the popliteal fossa and at the level of the proximal fibula. And then, of course, it is a source of indistinct lateral knee pain which is associated with pain damage. So if you are <coughs> having a patient with all of these problems, then maybe you should try to see whether there, there is an involvement of the lateral collateral ligament. So again, this is another view, excuse me, of the lateral collateral ligament. So here I just do a scanning of the lateral collateral ligament and the uh, Look at my reference here. This is actually the location of the uh, popliteal fossa. And then you go and uh, you can see the, the fibrillar pattern that is attached to your fibular head. Okay, so uh, sometimes uh, this, this could be confusing when you do it uh, in the beginning because it could confuse you for structures that uh, may include your uh, uh, your uh, biceps femoris tendon and of course uh, your anterolateral ligament and uh, the iliotibial band so but we will discuss it in any way how to uh, scan that properly later on so this one is the biceps biceps femoris so what happened here is you just pivot the proximal portion but you don't change the fibular head and then you can see a bigger uh, hyperechoic structure here that is really the biceps femoris tendon so right here i just uh, kind of scan starting from your uh, fibula that's fibular head and then as i scan that what what i do eventually is to pivot the proximal part of the probe and then you can see that the fibers tend to change into a thin fibers and it becomes a thicker fiber because this now is your biceps femoris, the short head. So that is the one that is attached to your fibular head. Now here, I just want to show you what are the type of sport that uh, 
these structures could be injured. And uh, of course, we don't have this here, the skiing, but of course we have uh, soccer and the others, maybe <laughs> basketball or volleyball or whatever. Okay, now let's go to your anterolateral ligament. This is also a very interesting ligament. And uh, I just would like to inform you that if you read the script, the, the, the literature, you will find a lot of names referring to the same thing. For example, when it was first identified, it was called lateral joint capsule in 1879 by Dr. Zygond. And then it was also named short lateral ligament. And then, of course, in 1976, it's called the anterolateral structures and middle third of the lateral capsular ligament. In 1981, ligamentum tractobiale. In 1982, lateral femorotibia ligamentous attachment. And Terry, if you read his paper, you will re realize that until now, he continues to name it the capsule osseous layer of the ITD. But Apparently, this is still the same structure referring to the anterior lateral ligament. And of course, anterior oblique band and laprad call this the mid-third lateral capture ligament. And then 2007, they agreed to call it anterior lateral ligament. So just want to make you familiarize with all the names because as you read them, you might think, what is this structure all about? They are just referring to one structure, the anterior lateral ligament. Okay, it, it, it's present as young as in the fetus, and uh, they have identified also the posterior, the proximal, and of course, how are they attached? So you can see here, for example, that uh, the original attachment of the structure from the uh, femoral condyle up to the, or beneath the tibia from his, somewhere here, is the original attachment of the anterolateral ligament. So this is a fetus uh, cadaver that you are seeing right now. And then same holds true with this one. So you can see here that for instance, the lateral collateral ligament is crisscrossing with your anterolateral ligament. So there is actually an intersection somewhere here. So if, if you notice it, this anterolateral ligament goes uh, anterior while the uh, lateral collateral ligament or fibular collateral ligament goes posteriorly and inserts into the fibula. And right uh, in front of that anterior lateral ligament is of course your iliotibial band. We will show you that to you later on the, the other details. So, so it all goes in front this way. So it is uh, located between the lateral collateral ligaments. Sometimes they describe it differently. They say it's anterior, the posterior or just beside, but uh, it almost has a very close uh, origin from the lateral collateral ligament, but the insertion is just different. The anterior lateral ligament goes into the tibia, the lateral collateral ligament goes into the fibula. So again, here, this is uh, how they're related. So you, as you can see here, this is your lateral collateral ligament again. This is your anterior lateral ligament. And then, of course, assuming that right in front of that is iliotibial iliotil band. And there's a lot of other structures, you know, how it crisscrosses, especially the popliteus tendon that occupies the more anterior part of the femoral condyle over here. Okay. So, again, this is uh, the scanning that uh, I did for the anterolateral ligament. So, the one just on top of that is actually the iliotibial band. But since the patient is in a flex position, that's why you can see it uh, in a, in a, pattern like this, in a wavy pattern like this. So uh, anyway, so this is uh, how it's again connected. And the other thing here is that the anterolateral ligament has another ligament that attaches into the lateral meniscus. So in other words, if you endure your anterolateral ligament, it is possible that you will also endure the lateral meniscus. So we always think about this uh, lateral collateral ligament and we wonder why is there an injury at the lateral meniscus. It is because of the attachment, a small attachment of the anterolateral ligament into the lateral meniscus by a very tiny uh, ligament right here. And the 
the ligament is under tension during 30 degree of internal rotation. It is not an isometric ligament. So in other words, when we say not an isometric ligament, it is not taut in all range. In other words, there's only the first 30 degrees that it actually comes under tension. And beyond that, it is in a lax position already. And then it lengthens in knee flexion and internal tibial torsion. So here, this is also described as the layer three of what they call the Sibacher. So Dr. Sibacher also made a, a classification of uh, these layers of the lateral knee, and this is uh, described to be under the layer three. It attaches posterior and proximal to the lateral femoral. We, we already know that, and it goes right into the front. So function of anterior lateral ligament, this is a rotational knee stabilizer. It stabilizes the internal rotation of the knee and the translation, anterior translation of the lateral tibial plateau extra articularly. And together with anterior crew shape, it contributes to rot rotatory knee stability. And it supports ACL against internal tibial loads. It is also a stabilizer against internal tibial torsion, usually for flexion angles more than 30 degrees and a secondary stabilizer to the ACL in resisting anterior tibial translation, internal tibial rotation, and in preventing knee pivot shift phenomenon. So here, Dr. Uh, Shanka has nicely isolated and distinguished the two layers. So um, usually the best way to do it is to, is to actually bend the knee to, to 90 degrees and so what will happen here is that you can see the iliotibial band inserts into the more superior surface of the tibia and just underneath that would be your anterolateral ligament and they use the lateral inferior geniculate artery as a reference in order to see that you are in the right spot so that is where the anterolateral ligament is is uh, is connected. So you can see here the iliotibial band right on top and below that is the anterolateral ligament. So rate of injury for this ligament is 11% to about 79%. It varies so there's a lot of uh, the, the gap is really really big. The tibial attachment is a good reference for anterolateral ligament but ultrasound. All injuries is seen at the distal part so it's very easy to identify because the injuries are seen on the distal part. So reconstructing all injuries could reduce ACL reconstruction fa failures. So maybe it, it, it would be nice for our orthopedic friends that when you reconstruct your ACL, you have to take a look at this uh, structure and see if they are still intact or not. So you can see here the beautiful anterior lateral ligament and right on top is of course your iliotibial band. Again, this is another drawing, okay? So, uh, according to Capo, the ultrasound could be, uh, could, be, could be seen, but it's in terms of its utility in diagnosing um, might be limited. So again, uh, MRI can be a very helpful tool in diagnosing that structure. So all injuries, could be associated with other injuries, as you can see here. And uh, among ACL injuries, all would have a 40% injury as well. And 70% of ALL injuries showed poor healing at one year follow-up of ACL injury. So since this is a missed diagnosis a lot of times, so when you don't fix this, uh, you might feel frustrated why even as you have already fixed the ACL, you still have problems. Maybe you have to look at the anterior lateral ligament. So 46% of knee MRI shows an ACL injury has all injuries. 78.8% of ACL reconstruction has distal ligament injuries. And there is also another thing here that maybe might be an interest for, to you, especially to get to give you a clue as to whether you are dealing with this by looking at 
what they call the second fracture, a fracture at the proximal tibia, where there is an attachment of the ALL. And what they're saying is that if you have a second fracture, you, you are, at, at, in most instances, might have an ACL there as well. So very important information. So now let's go to your iliotibial band. So iliotibial band is also a very uh, interesting uh, structure because of course we only see that as a attachment of the uh, of the muscle coming from the tensor fascia at approximately and going to the iliotibial band distally to insert the girdish tubercle of the tibia. But actually there's a lot of details here that you can see. And Dr. Sibacher has actually identified three layers. And what he's saying is that the ilu uh, tibial band has uh, an insertion into the patella and upper patellar tendon, they, they call it the ilu patellar band. And then there is also what they call the superficial ITB. And then it goes on the way to the fascia and the biceps femoris. This is the layer one of Sibacher layer of the ilu tibial band. So here you can see all the layers of the superficial layers. I don't have to go through all of those, but let me just point out here that the iliotibial band has a distal attachment that is called, that is uh, against the distal femur called the Kaplan fibers. And the Kaplan fibers are very important fibers wherein if you actually rupture these fibers, this also will give you a lot of problems with your iliotibial band. And of course, uh, it goes all the way and then attaches to a uh, part of the anterolateral ligament and what Dr. Uh, Terry initially called the capsular osseous layer of the deep ITB, which is actually an attachment of the anterolateral ligament. So here, as you can see here, the Kaplan fibers has, has uh, two attachments. We have the proximal, and we have the distal. And then of course, there is also a division in the middle, which they call the intermuscular septum that is actually attached to the distal part of the femur. And then as it attaches, there's also another layer of the iliotibial band that goes deep. They call this the deep iliotibial band. And that is also where you can see here the anterolateral capsule or the capsule osseous layer, which is actually the anterolateral ligament. So as you can see here, that these structures right below, which is identified to be anterolateral ligament, is also connected with your uh, deep fibers of the iliotibial band. And this superficial and the deep forms a functional unit that contributes to the rotatory instability. And here, they also identify that the deep part even as it appears to be deep, is actually slightly posterior than the superficial layer of the ITB in the Gerdes tubercle. So this is another drawing of the attachment with the intermuscular septum, as you can see that in the drawing. And then this is the most that we can see of the iliotibial band, of course. We don't see the attachment proximally uh, of those Kaplan fibers. So this is all that we can see as, as to its attachments to the tibia here. And then, of course, uh, when we are looking at uh, problems all of the iliotibial band, then we try to uh, identify the, the insertion. But at the same time, the friction between your uh, femoral condyle right here and your uh, iliotibial band. And that is the reason why among runners, uh, there is an increased amount of fluid that may be found in between those layers, which is what we call sometimes the runner's knee, but actually it's the friction of the iliotibial band against the femoral condyle. So this is again the capsulosus layer. We know that already the capsulosus layer is the anterolateral ligament. And of course the Kaplan fibers is the attachment on the proximal part of the deep iliotibial band. Then of course here, this these are the details. We have the proximal Kaplan, the distal Kaplan fibers, and also the capsular osseous layer here, uh, the dip, which we know is also part of the 
uh, anterolateral ligament. So we know that already. But the other thing that is very helpful as a reference to identify the the proximity of those structures is by identifying a superior lateral geniculate artery. Now this one could be seen in the ultrasound because of the of the uh, when you turn on the Doppler, so you can actually uh, identify this uh, genicular artery right here. Okay, so here another detail of all these details in the uh, iliotibial band. Another uh, representation of how they are attached into the proximal distal femur and how they are related with other structures like your lateral collateral ligament and then of course your popliteus tendon. Okay, so here, how do we uh, make use of this information? So what about the Kaplan fibers? So 18.6% is the prevalence of Kaplan injury in patients with ACL. So if you have an ACL injury, it's possible that 18.6% of that will uh, have Kaplan fibers. Now, if you do it less than 90 days, you have a chance of 23.7% of diagnosing it. And if you do it more than 90% of 90 days, then your chances of diagnosing is, is, is becoming low at 6.4%. So in other words, it's very good if you can do an MRI less than 90 days after the injury, so you will know exactly what's happening. Kaplan fiber also will have a concomitant injury to the lateral meniscus. We know that already because the interlateral ligament has a small ligament that is attached to the lateral meniscus, which is part of the capsular osseous fibers, actually. So these are diagnostic criteria for signs of uh, Kaplan fiber injury. Actually, what is important here is the wavy appearance to the Kaplan fibers, which is the only one that we can see, obviously, in, in MRI. So again, this is uh, the MRI picture of the uh, structure. Now we go to the anterolateral complex of the knee, which is actually, as we mentioned, is made up of the superficial, middle, and deep layers. And we know also that the capsular osseous layer of the ITB is no other than the ALL. It provides rotatory knee stability and of course, uh, it is also important in uh, making sure that the ACL is also stable with the stability of the Kaplan fiber. So there is a consensus about the anterolateral complex. And uh, what they say is that whenever there is a second fracture, and this is actually a multiple structures where all of these structures are attached, this is considered to be a pathognomonic of an ACL injury. So by X-ray, you see a second fracture, a fracture of the proximal tibia on the lateral side, then it may be safe to say that you might have an ACL and injury according to this consensus meeting. So uh, posterior fibers of the ITB and lateral capsule attached to second fracture in about 94% of cases. So this is a, a fracture here, a second fracture right here, a second fracture here. This is a view of the ultrasound. So you can also see this in the x-ray as just a chip fracture on the lateral side of the knee, which is shown like this. Okay, this is another uh, complex of the knee. They call it the condylar strap. Actually, this is another findings by Dr. Landrieu recently in 2019. And he was saying that this is a distinct structure from the capsule osseous layer and ALL and Kaplan fibers. We don't know yet, but that is what they found out. Now let's go to the IT band friction syndrome. This is an overused knee injuries among runners. This is also seen in cyclists, hockey players, basketball. And this is also seen in 62% of female runners, 38% of male, and of course in 24% of cyclists. And uh, it is characterized by a swelling and a discrete fluid collection in between the condyle of the femur and of course the iliotibial band. So look at this uh, hypoechoic or anechoic uh, sign here. When you see that, then that could tell you that you're dealing with this kind of problems. So here is again a scan of uh, how you can see that uh, the iliotibial band from the distal insertion 
up to the proximal insertion here at the femoral condyle. Now, they did an experiment among runners, and this is what they found out. Before running, they didn't see any change in the adventitial tissue between your iliotibial band and the femur. But after running, look at that. It begins to swell, and there is an adipose tissue vascularity in between that layer. So this is a normal running. In other words, uh, if you would like to test yourself before running and after running, you might be able to see changes like this when you do your ultrasound. So you can do your interventional procedure. You can inject in between the layers of the uh, iliotibial band and of course the femur. Then let's go to the medial patellofemoral ligament. I hope you're still okay. You're still okay? Okay. Yes, now we have uh, the medial patellofemoral ligament. The medial patellofemoral ligament is made up of three layers. Now I wouldn't want to uh, discuss all this, but just for your information. And ultrasound is scanned with the knee flex. Transverse from the patella to the femoral con condyle. And uh, as you can see, this is how it looks like. So this is your patella, this is your femur, and then the, the ligament in between is what we call the medial patellofemoral ligament. And what is important here is that there is an intersection between your medial patellofemoral ligament and your medial collateral ligament at the medial side of the knee. And this intersection is called your nomura point. Okay, so this is when the medial patellofemoral ligament wraps around the proximal aspect of the medial collateral ligament. And this is attached between the adductor tubercle and your medial epicondyle. And then if you try to scan down, you can see another ligament from the medial part of the patella at the lower pole or the inferior pole. It inserts into your meniscus. This is your patellomeniscal ligament. Then there's another ligament going to your uh, lower portion of the uh, or the proximal tibia. This is your medial patellotibia ligament. So we can see here the three different uh, types of ligament at the medial patellofemoral. And this is the one, the first one is the one that is severed when we have a lateral knee dislocation. And this is the site of the rupture right here close to the, the nomura point. Okay, so you've, you've got that. And so here, we have here the basus medialis oblicus, and then you scan from the patella, going to the lateral side of the femur, and you can see here the attachment of the medial patella femoral ligament, and where they intersect with the medial collateral ligament, that is what you call the nomura point. Always do it in a knee flex position, because you won't be able to appreciate it if it is in an extended position because this ligament will tend to lax. So it is tense when you are actually uh, flexing the knee. So this is another uh, drawing of that same structure. And then of course, uh, another representation how it looks like on a cadaver dissection of the patello meniscal. It goes all the way to the uh, medial meniscus. And of course the medial patellotibial ligament into the proximal tibia. Then of course, uh, this one is your medial patellomeniscal ligament. Okay, it's a very short ligament. And then this is your medial patellotibial ligament. It's a relatively uh, strong and uh, thick ligament that inserts into your tibia. Then of course, uh, you can see that there are other ligament here which is also attached to the a quadriceps at the basus medialis. So we've shown that to you already. But very importantly, where they intersect is where the rupture really happens on this area because of lateral patellar dislocation. So when you have a lateral patellar dislocation, you don't forget to check this structure because this is usually ruptured. 
Okay, so you can see that in ultrasound, you can diagnose it, and so there's no, no reason why you don't scan that area when you have a lateral patellar dislocation. Now, when we are scanning the medial collateral ligament, and let me just go back here, uh, the, there is this area is actually composed of also three layers. And uh, posterior to that, if you can look at the middle part of the drawing here, when we uh, consider the medial collateral ligament, if you actually go scan and just move it posteriorly, you, you can see an expansion of what seems to be also the medial collateral ligament, but actually this is your posterior oblique ligament. This seems to be a distinct ligament from your medial collateral because if you look at your medial collateral, it goes all the way down below your pes and serine. Did you notice this drawing at the middle? So from the medial epicondyle, it goes down and then it inserts into your uh, pes and serine region, on the medial side of the, of the tibia. But the posterior oblique ligament, the POL, doesn't go that far. It just inserts more at the uh, medial and posterior part of the tibia right here. And then posterior to that, you can see the uh, medial gastric tendon already. So right here, I just move and try to scan it posteriorly following the fibers of the medial collateral line, and I was able to see the posterior oblique ligament. So that is your posterior oblique. It is just another ligament posterior to your medial collateral ligament. And then of course, this is just another drawing of the same structure which we have shown you a while ago. So let's go now to the medial ligaments of the knee. So as we have mentioned earlier, the medial collateral ligament is made up of three layers. Okay, we have the, the layer that is just beneath your subcutaneous tissue. Then we have your intermediate, or what they sometimes call the super, superficial medial collateral ligament. And then we have the deep medial collateral ligament. And the deep medial collateral ligament is connected with two ligaments. The first one on the medial, on the femoral side, we call it the meniscofemoral. And the one on the tibial side, we call this the meniscotibial ligaments. This is what we call the coronary ligaments. So coronary ligaments and meniscotibial ligaments are one and the same structure. So just for you to know, they are just the same. They are part of the deep layer of the medial collateral ligament. So if you look at this drawing, this is by Dimai Center. So you, you will notice that if you go more anteriorly, you only see the anterior layer, which is the layer one, and of course the layer two that is merged with your medial patellar retinaculum. If you go more medial or at the middle side, there is a split between the superficial and the deep. And then this is sometimes where some fluid can come. And some people would call this really a bursa right here, but actually it's not. And then if you go to more posterior, then you can see here some other structures uh, like your sartorius and gracilis. And below that is your uh, layer two of the medial collateral ligament attaches to the deep layer of the medial collateral ligament, which is the one that is attached to the meniscotibial and the meniscofemoral, depending on where we are looking at it. You're looking at it at the side of the tibia or we're looking at the side of the femur. So let us just say you are following the medial collateral ligament. So when we you follow that, so what you are looking at the ultrasound is just the superficial and then the deep layer. The one that is the first one right here is not very distinct in ultrasound. And the medial collateral is attached at the medial side by the coronary ligaments or meniscotibial. And the one that is attached at the femoral side is the meniscofemoral. But look at the insertion here at the best answering area. You will notice the medial, uh, should I say the, hold on. 
happen. Okay, it's under your best answering insertion right here. And uh, of course, uh, you can also see the medial inferior geniculate nerve right here, which is actually the infrapatellar saphenous nerve. So uh, if you are going to inject this part of the medial collateral ligament, you have to go underneath the pes and serine to be able to reach the medial collateral insertion at the distal uh, side of the tibia. So you only see in the ultrasound this much layer when you scan them. And uh, uh, you can see here a dynamic uh, picture of how the medial collateral ligament could be attached. Uh, this, is, this is really a very long ligament in the medial side of the knee. And then you can see how their fibers are attached deeply and then how the best answering is just very superficial. These three layers are toys gracilis and your semi-tendinosus. So the layer three, which is the one that is attached uh, is very important because it kind of stabilizes the medial collateral. And in fact, this is also the reason why when you enjoy your medial collateral ligament, you kind of also enjoy your medial meniscus and together with some injuries of the proximal distal femur and the proximal tibia. And of course, when we try to scan that area, we can see also some fluids in between. And as I have mentioned earlier, that could be the bursting between the superficial and the deep layer. And that is also a concern, especially for osteoarthritis in a medial knee pain. So uh, you understand already that the coronary ligament is actually a meniscotibial ligament, which is the deep attachment layer of the medial collateral ligament. So uh, this is much I can see from what I have. So this is your meniscotibial, this is your meniscofemoral, uh, the coronary ligaments. So the medial collateral ligament is the main medial stabilizer to valgus loading of the knee. So there are, there are three layers as we have mentioned. And this sartorial layer is not obviously seen in the ultrasound. We only see the middle layer and the deep uh, layer. And the middle layer is the one that goes more posteriorly to be the thickening of the capsule posterior to the medial collateral, what we call the posterior oblique ligament, the one that I've shown you earlier. And then of course, uh, this is another uh, a scanning of the medial collateral ligament. Anyway, so the medial collateral ligament is under the pes and serine so when we look at the best answer, it's more superficial and the medial collateral ligament is deeper than that. So this is another details of all the different structures, how they attach and how you can see it uh, related to other uh, structures of uh, the muscles, especially the medial gastrocnemius uh, muscle. Uh, also this one, these are the other muscles of the, uh, I would say, the anterolateral, uh, medial and posterior part of the knee, including the semi-membranous um, uh, tendon. So MCL injuries, this is four times more common than lateral collateral ligament. It is more common in young athletes, especially in football and soccer, and direct lateral blow to the knee or bulbous movement, movement will uh, cause the injury and of course uh, the grading is almost similar to that which we already identified in the lateral collateral ligament. So just to show you again this is the medial collateral and posterior to that is your posterior oblique ligament and uh, this, that's also what we have uh, shown you a while ago. So this is another uh, ultrasound uh, image of the posterior oblique ligament of the knee joint. So in the in the MRI, they identified a wave lesions that could signify that there is a rupture of the distal superficial medial collateral ligament. In fact, they they say that this is the most the more uh, important structure that they would like to see the distal superficial medial collateral ligament if there is a medial knee injuries. 
Now let's go now to your patellar tendon. Now patellar tendon is uh, made up of two layers. We have your anterior and we have the posterior layer. You might you might wonder why they were classified into that layering because eventually you will realize that most of the uh, vascularity, blood supply and injury is because of the lack of it or the, the presence of the blood supply. So for example, in anterior patella, the anterior patella is, is uh, supplied by several blood vessels. But look at the posterior patella. The posterior patella only depends upon the anastomotic arch of the Hoffa's fat pad with their smaller arteries. In which case, that explains why a lot of times the injury in the patellar tendon happens at the deeper layer, the proximal deeper layer of the patella. So if you will, okay, so this is another ultrasound of the patellar tendon. This is the long axis, this is the short axis here. Now, they, they, they did the study on uh, the incidence of pain and injuries on the patella and what they found out that most of the injury happens at the proximal posterior part of the patella. In fact, if your patellar tendon thickness is more than 8.8 .8 millimeters, it is already strongly correlated with tear of the tendon. So you, you, you may not be able to see the tendon itself, the tear itself. But if you measure it and get a thickness measurement of more than 8.8, .8, then that signifies already a tear of the tendon. And the next time you let the athlete play again, they might really have an actual tear. And uh, if you have a thickness of more than 11.5, they're saying it does not respond with non-operative treatment. So this is a very important uh, information that you can use to be able to guide yourself what kind of treatment would you do if you have all these measurements. So more than 8.8, .8, tear. More than 11.5, that is not operative, uh, that is not responding to non-operative treatment, including your PRP. So these are guide decisions. This is very detailed. I cannot explain to you everything one by one, but you can probably just take a photo of this and then uh, keep it to yourself and then review it and uh, find out what you can do to address a patellar tendon problem in your clinic. So grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. So these are the images based on the MRI. So no tear with tendinosis, grade two with partial tears, with percentage tear thickness uh, less than 25%. Grade three, moderate partial tears. And then grade four uh, with the severe partial tears. And then with tear thickness ratio of more than 50%. In other words, the tendency for it to uh, have uh, that much tear when you push the athlete to uh, play eventually. So this is another picture of the ultrasound. So always do a power dock and check at the proximal uh, port of the patella. That is where you can expect a lot of neovascularization and try to measure the depth. If it's more than 8.8, .8, consider it a tear. Now let's go to the anterior crochet. We're almost there. So we know this. This is a very important uh, ligament in our knee. It has two bundles, the anterior medial and posterior lateral. And then of course, it is supplied by middle genicular artery. And of course, it is innervated by tibial nerve by means of proprioception. So in other words, the tibial nerve that supplies the ACL is only mainly involved in proprioception and not pain. And there is only a very minimal pain fibers. I was trying to look for Bapers evidences saying that it is the obturator nerve that supplies this. I haven't found anything. 
Uh, so it's not the obturator nerve, it's the tibial nerve. So here is an anterior scanning of your uh, uh, anterior cruciate. So what you do is uh, to put it uh, sagittal oblique. So your your pivot, your your probial pivot outwardly, in order to see this uh, cruciate ligament on the anterior part. But uh, this is not a very important uh, site to see if you are trying to look for pathology because a lot of times the injury doesn't happen on the site. But just for you to maybe uh, your bragging rights, maybe that you can you can actually show the anterior cruciate in front just to. Uh, do, tell everybody that you can do. In fact, uh, they were trying to do some test, applying drawers test in order to see if there's anything that they can see here. You cannot see any pathology at the anterior ACL. So unless you just wanted to view it, there's no uh, clinical significance in viewing this uh, for clinical purposes, but only for just viewing it for the purpose of showing to everybody that you know how to scan your ACL. Now here, the best place to scan for your ACL is at the posterior, in the in between your medial and lateral uh, condyle, femoral condyle. And if you put your probe here, you can see the popliteal artery right there. And the attachment of the ACL is more on into the lateral side of the lateral femoral condyle. So you have to sh see this part here. So this is where the ACL is, the one with the star. And on the opposite side is where the posterior crochet is. But this one is the one. And take note of this because later on, I'll show you something here on how to uh, diagnose uh, ACL by ultrasound, ACL injury by ultrasound. So ACL injuries, in most instances is a non-contact injury. In other words, there is not, not really a co contact uh, uh, injury in sports. It just so happened that there is maybe uh, a dynamic movement of the knee where the patient has a planted foot and uh, twisted his knee and then there is a popping sound that you hear. And most of the time that is what happens. And then, of course, uh, what they also found is out is that when you don't treat it, in about 10 years, you will have 50 to 60 percent will develop osteoarthritis. And less than two thirds of post ACL reconstruction return to sports after a year. So, in other words, a lot of this ACL, no matter how good you are in terms of rehabilitation, two thirds of them doesn't return uh, after a year. And of course, in immature athlete, it is within nine months. So preventing measures is, uh, especially for this, is a soft landing in order to not to uh, tense your ACL too much. And then here also, for acute injuries of ACL, there is a more meniscal tear in both instances, whether you're talking about chronic or acute, although there's more in chronic, than in acute, but you can see here that uh, in both ways, they always develop a meniscal tear. And also they found out that in ACL, there is always a lateral meniscal tear that goes with it instead of just medial meniscal tear. I thought in the beginning that medial meniscal tear is common, but with this data here, you can see that uh, there are more lateral meniscal tear that happens actually. And then the, these are the location uh, for for those uh, meniscal tear in is ACL injuries. And uh, you can see that it is uh, common in zone one, okay? And also uh, sometimes at zone one, two, three, which is the one shown in blue, okay? And then of course here, ACL and posterior cruciate in intercondylar nuts where they are attached. So you can see it's the, the ACL is more lateral, the uh, posterior cruciate is more medial. And then of course, for the return to sports, uh, uh, there is a lot of information here that uh, we can learn. But of course, uh, 
there is a return to sports, but there is also a return to participation and return to performance. So these are three different things that we have to consider when we are uh, planning the patient to return to sports so that we can address them, them uh, nicely and appropriately. And then of course, they're saying that the single hop for distance and the ACL is the strongest parameter in predicting return to pre-injury sport six months after ACL repair. So return to pre-injury sports after bilateral ACL is 40% as compared to 83% after the first ACL reconstruction. Okay, so there are factors that could affect that. So there are delaying factors like bruises, proprioception, ligamentization, neuromuscular control, knee strength, and then of course, until such time that uh, there is a resolution of those factors, which will take at least two years. So it's a long way to go. And then of course, uh, how much osteoarthritis can we see in, in ACL? And where do we see it? Now 35% is at the tibiofemoral femoral area and 15% is in the patellofemoral area. So those are the areas that you have to check if you are to look at it both in the x-ray and also in the ultrasound. So age is not a factor, although they're saying the matured age athletes arrive at OAN point sooner. And so those are things that uh, may be semantics that they, they, they try to uh, uh, call for uh, similar uh, cases. Again, another way of looking at the knee anteriorly. And then, of course, uh, this is just the same. Now, let me just uh, show you these indirect findings that Dr. Ken Mautner, remember Dr. Ken Mautner used to be with us. He identified three signs. Number one is the femoral nuts sign, the PCL wave sign, and the capsular protrusion sign. Now, the femoral nut sign, the one I've shown you initially, where to look at it, it, ha it has a 93.8% specificity. So in other words, when you see it, it's there. It is present. But the sensitivity is very low, 56.6%. The PCL wave sign has a sensitivity of 84.9%. And the capsular protrusion sign uh, varies between 68 and then 77. Now, if two of the three of the signs are present, the sensitivity goes up to 86.8% and the specificity goes up to 87.5%. Now, let's take a look how it's being done. Okay. Now, this is something that you have to remember, really. You might forget everything that I have talked about, but this one, remember this. Okay. So here, put your probe on the transverse part of the knee like this, and then you have to see the medial and lateral femoral condyle, and then focus on the lateral condyle more than the medial femoral condyle. And what you will be looking at is this notch sign, this anechoic area here. If you look at this, because this is where the attachment of the ACL is, that shows that you have a positive intercondylar sign. In most probability, you have an ACL rupture. Okay, so when you look at this, that is an ACL rupture. Now, that is specific, but the sensitivity is only more than 50%. So you are not convinced. Maybe uh, you say to yourself, uh, this is not, uh, okay, hold on. What happened here? Okay. So you have to check for the other one and you go to the where the location of the posterior cruciate ligament is. So when you scan the posterior cruciate, you scan it in a, a sagittal plane. And then when you look at the posterior cruciate, when you scan from the uh, middle side going to the middle side, you, you look at the posterior crochet, which is anechoic. Under normal circumstances, it is usually a concave part of the capsule of the posterior crochet here. 
but when there is a convexity in other words there is a protrusion here okay that is what they call the capsular protrusion sign which means that there is nothing that keeps it or prevents it from that area because normally it is occupied by the anterior cruciate but because the anterior cruciate is ruptured then this, the the posterior cruciate will push it up and then you develop a capsular protrusion sign and that is the second sign so that is two over three the number three is the wave-like p-cell sign normally you see the posterior cruciate to be straight like this and he will show that to you later also but if you see a wave that protrudes also like this then that is passive for wave-like wave PCL sign this is where you need to scan your cruciate and not at the anterior side you wouldn't see anything at the anterior you only see it that at the posterior side so if there's anything wrong here it can give you an idea that the anterior crochet is ruptured. Of course, we're not saying that this is better than MRI. Of course, MRI is always the best. But in the absence of MRI, and probably those patients who might have missed all this, then this is a very useful way of knowing that something is really happening in the anterior crochet. And you have to do it in the first 10 weeks post injury. First 10 weeks post injury okay so this is another ultrasound uh, image and uh, dr mountner says it cannot replace mri but it can help decrease undetected acl injuries and spare patients unnecessary treatment okay so when we measure actually the capsular protrusion sign we also have to measure the thickness of the pcl and if it is thickened when you compare the right and left then something is really happening with the anterior crochet you check the pcl to check the acl actually so this is that the this is the capsular protrusion sign is uh, an imaging of the pcl but you are looking at the pathology of the acl okay another uh, radiographic signs that you can also uh preclude that there could be an ACL injury is a lateral femoral nut sign. This is by the x-ray. So you just look at this area here. Okay, this is a line and then there is a, some kind of a fossa right there. So if you, if you, if you have a 1.0 millimeter measurement, then that is also a sign of an ACL injury. So according to this, 1.5 millimeters ACL okay and then of course uh, hold on if it is more than two millimeters it indicates lateral meniscus stairs so that those are things that you need to remember also when in the absence of ultrasound in the absence of mri you can still uh, consider that there, there could be an acl injury and then of course the second fracture that we mentioned earlier now let's go to your posterior cruciate so posterior crochet, just like your anterior crochet, is made of two bundles. It has a larger anterolateral bundle than a posterior medial bundle. Okay, so you can see here that when you scan it, you go in the middle. You start from the lat from the medial side, or you can start from the medial side. You can go to the middle portion, and then you can uh, look at this structure right in the middle of the knee. So you can measure it. Uh, I have measured it, and it is usually anechoic, okay? So that is your PCL. And of course, uh, these are different uh, injuries. Motorcycle is the most common. <laughs> Look at that. And then, of course, the location of the different uh, structures that goes with the, pos uh, with the posterior cruciate. It's attachment in the tibia, okay? Uh, I wouldn't belabor you to see this but the the reason i show this to you is also to show that there is another ligament in between the remember the ligament of humphreys and the ligament of risberg uh, those are the ligament there and of course here you can also check it like this okay and of course uh, this is how i scan i start from the medial side you can see the medial gastrox and see my member noses crisscrossing and then move it towards the center as i scan and then 
you can see right there. Oops. Ooh. Where is it? Okay. Uh, let me repeat that again. So here, so you can see that as I go to the Mitchell side, I will be able to identify, oops. Identify the posterior cruciate, okay, right, right here. Look at that, yes, that anechoic portion here is the posterior cruciate, okay. So PCL injuries, 40% of them occur in isolation, but 60% occur with other structures, okay. When the knee is examined in full extension, any opening in virus or valgus stress indicates a collateral ligament injuries. You also check for neurovascular structures involvement, like popliteal injury, perineal nerve injury, and also monosca injury. And dashboard injury, which we know is one of the causes of PCL, only occur in 35% of the time. And these are the other combined ruptures of PCL. Okay, so look at that. The highest is combination of PCL, PLC, posterior lateral corner, LCL, or MCL. Those are the more common ones. So complications of untreated. Grade one, grade two, you can treat conservatively. More than four years follow-up of previous PCL injury, the osteoarthritis will set in. 10% of PCL in 10 years will develop osteoarthritis. And of course, some of them will develop neurovascular complications as well. Now, the last part is meniscofemoral ligaments. This is the ligament that goes with posterior cruciate. When we say anterior meniscofemoral, it's anterior to the PCL. When we say posterior meniscofemoral, that is posterior to the um, uh, PCL. So anterior is Humphreys, posterior is Risberg. Okay. So this is your meniscofemoral ligament. So this is anterior, so this is Humphreys, this is Humphreys. And then the reason why we need to also mention this is because this is sometimes misinterpreted to be the cruciate ligament. Uh, and to some extent, they, they thought this could uh, also obscure the, the, the injury in the PCL and that's why sometimes it remains undetected because they thought it's the meniscofemoral ligament that is injured. And then of course this, this could be form, form part of the PCL complex and it acts in synergy. Okay and uh, this could degenerate with age but these are both present in young age. Now the Risberg is the one that is uh, seen posteriorly just to show you how are they located to each other. And of course, here is another picture of the anterior and the posterior together, and then the, the relationship with the posterior cruciate ligament. And that's another detail of all these uh, beautiful structures and ligaments of the knee. So I think I have to stop here. I have uh, already lectured for how many hours already? <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you're still alive. I'm sorry for keeping you this late in the evening. Uh, I don't know if they have any questions. Yes, Let Dr. Just... Jim. Thank you so much for your lecture. Actually, I have a few I have a few questions. Is it okay to ask? Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Dr. Jim, it's really amazing how you can see all of these doctors. Yes, Dr. Byron Garcia's it's super detailed. <laughs> These are the structures that uh, it seems you can't even see. <laughs> and you can okay. see. So, maybe, doctor, my first question is, uh, doctor, the feedback is okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Dr. James, so for us who are, you know, not as, as good as your level is, how uh how do you what are the pearls that you can advise us how we can actually visualize like the ALL uh, I think that uh is it a matter of frequency of course anatomy is given and positioning of the patient I noticed that you were using a linear probe 
So is there anything that we have to adjust just so we can see it better? Okay, for ALL, as I had mentioned earlier, the, the best way to, to scan the ALL is to flex the knee to 90 degrees. And then remember where the iliotibial band is attached to the tibia. Okay, so you look first the iliotibial band. The iliotibial band is on top. So on a flex knee, you can see the iliotibial band. And all you have to do is just to uh, change the focus to the one beneath that area. That is your anterolateral ligament. But when, when you're explaining it as if it's so easy, Dr. Jim. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think we have a surgeon in the house. So I just want to ask, how, uh, how often do we inspect the uh, ALL, Dr. Paolo Tabar? How often do you see it and do you actually inspect it with people? Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi, Pash. Hi, hi, sir. Good evening. Yes. Um, it's really oh, no, hard. Uh, yes, sir. Hello, sir. It's it's really hard to uh, appreciate all those things that you shown earlier, especially if the if the field becomes bloody. Even though if you use tourniquet, it's really hard to distinguish all those structures, particularly because they are embedded with, uh, underneath the subcutaneous tissue. So for me, um. It's, it's it's hard to dissect, but it's true, sir, that if we didn't repair the posterior lateral complex postoperatively, we could see the patients, their legs are in external rotated. So the trend now for the arthroscopy, sir, when you have an ACL there, you have to check the posterior lateral complex to, to prevent the external rotation of the of the leg. So it's it's, it's correct, sir, that we have to to, 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 to repair that's a posterior lateral complex. So by doing that, sir, we 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 harvest the the grassy, the the semitan and bundled it across the fibula. Okay. So that will act as a a, a, a reconstructed PCL complex. Okay. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you for the lecture, sir. Yeah, thank because you, sir. actually uh, that is exactly the reason why we need to understand those ligaments because if we don't really do anything about it you will have a chronic knee instability and it's very difficult to explain to the patient why you have done your job nicely to repair the ACL, but why is it that there is a lot of chronic knee instability? And also yes, importantly is uh, the patellar tendon. If, if you notice, the patellar tendon is a very critical tendon that sometimes uh, they, they don't really examine that very carefully. And Repair of the tendon is very high for athletes. So it's very important to right away check the thickness. As we have mentioned, 8.8 .8 millimeters. If it is an 8.8 .8 millimeters, consider that a patellar tendon tear. Whether you see it or not, that, that's just that's still a tear. And of course, uh, those uh, indirect signs of ACL that was uh, written by Dr. Maltner, he talks about that. You can see that if in the absence of MRI, so for example, you would like to check, the best way to check, the best way to inject is at the posterior knee, not in the anterior knee for ACL, because that is where the rupture happens. Of course, mo most of the tear is mid-substance, but after the mid-substance, the next area of tear is posterior third of the anterior crochet. So may, may I add, sir? Yes. Sir, uh, regarding the, 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 the PCL signs, uh, we have to take note. Uh, if there's a, an, an abalsam fracture of the tibial tubercle, then you know, we have to consider an ACL tear also. So maybe yeah. by doing an ultrasound, we could see a fracture, an abalsam fracture of the attachment. Then yes. most likely there's an ACL tear. Yes, sir. Yeah, we mentioned the second fracture already. A second fracture is already uh, an indication that there, there is an ACL injury. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Tabar, Dr. Pao. So uh, a second fracture is a fracture of the tibia. So if you see that, it's a path pathognomonic already of uh, ACL injury. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Jim, we have another question here from Dr. Byron Garcia. Bye, would you like to ask your question directly to Dr. Jim? 
Um, hi, Dr. Jim. Um, hi. Hi, Byron. Wondering, uh, is there an advantage in uh, using a curvilinear probe instead of a linear probe for detecting the indirect signs in uh, ACL tear so that there's deeper penetration? Would it be possible to use a curvilinear or? Yeah, it's 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 possible, but the, the problem is uh, you might lose the picture by by the attenuation of the depth because actually these are very superficial structure. You can better see this with linear probe rather than by curvilinear. But you can still see the curvilinear. For example, if you are diagnosing, in the, in the absence of an MRI, you are diagnosing a tear of the anterior cruciate and you are using a curvilinear probe, you can hardly see the anechoic change in the intercondylar groove when you use a curvilinear uh, probe. But if you if you use the linear probe, it's very easy actually. You you can try it yourself. You use the linear probe and move it uh, in between your um, medial and lateral femoral condyle, and try to wag your needle, do heel toe, do tilting, and then you will be able to find out that very hyperechoic. They usually show very hyperechoic under normal patients. But when you have a problem, especially ruptured, you can see that uh, notch on that area. It's anechoic. Uh, as a follow-up question, Dr. Jim, would it be different if I do the scanning like um, first day on the first day of the injury, second day, especially for traumatic um, cases of ACL, would there be, uh, would it be harder to visualize it due to the trauma? Usually, I would uh, the the of course less than less than ten weeks or should I say uh, the, the closer it is to the injury actually the better. Oh, okay. But uh, you have to repeat. Let's say you you do it on the sideline. You have to repeat it after two days to be able to see if there is any change because sometimes there's so much fluid. I agree. There's so much fluid because of the blood that comes out of it, so you might not be able to see it. So what you can do is to evacuate the fluid first, and you expect it to be bloody, and then when all the fluids are evacuated, then you can scan again and check if you can see the same thing. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Dr. Jim, I have another question. For the structures that you've mentioned, let's say the more detailed structure, would you say that it's still easy to detect them, or is it uh, only during inflammatory process do we detect them easier. I mean, when you look at it on a normal uh, structure uh, or normal circumstances, is it easy to identify those detailed structures that you just taught us? Actually, you see it better when it's normal because you can you can really uh, check everything. But the moment uh, there is an abnormality, uh, you can hardly see it. And uh, I should say it's difficult to see to see it because you will have to uh, see it from its normal position. It's not there. Yeah, but uh, there, 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 you really follow a technique, especially the the posterior lateral corner because there's just a lot of them in the posterior lateral corner. There's so many of them, right? The rest are easier, but this area at the posterior and lateral are very critical, but Getting used to it uh, will make it easier, actually, if you keep repeating it. Yeah. So practice makes perfect. On our next perfect. workshop, you have to yes. include this, okay, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, hopefully. Yes. Okay, so do we have any more questions in our with our audience? or? Yeah. I think they're sleepy now. Yes, because uh, it was really very detailed, Dr. Jim, and thank you very much. I think we can yeah. view this all on YouTube, correct? Yes, yes. You will be posting this. So okay. we would like to thank everybody for to watching and uh, participating to today's in today's lecture. Dr. Asmi is here again, Dr. Rusli, and all our local uh, our uh, local uh, consultants like Dr. Joy, and of course our friend uh, Ortho, Dr. Tabar. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Jim, thank you have you. any last words? Yeah, thank you. Uh, last words is let's all sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, have a good day.
Thank you very much, Dr. Jim. Oy, nandiyan ka pala, Jojo. Siyempre, <laughs> siyempre. No, thank you. I, I, I have to tell you that uh, I, I somehow remember Dr. Carlo Martinoli when I hear you lecture. <laughs> Wala, malayo ako, Jo. Malayo, malayo. <laughs> <laughs> I think tonight we are channeling Dr. Carlo. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you, Jojo. Thank you for, for your for professionalism, Dr. <laughs> I know you're not feeling at your best today, but you are here and you did push through with the lecture. And I very much appreciate you for that, Dr. Jin. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. God bless everyone. Okay. Thank you, Joe. God bless.